Inshallah, we'll do some salawat until um, everyone joins with Allah Ta'ala. Allahumma salli wa sallam wa barak ala Sayyidina Muhammad. <coughs> Allahumma salli wa sallam wa barak ala Sayyidina Muhammad. Allahumma salli wa sallam wa barak ala Sayyidina Muhammad. Allahumma salli wa sallam wa barak ala Sayyidina Muhammad. Allahumma salli wa sallam wa barak ala Sayyidina Muhammad. Allahumma salli wa sallam wa barak ala Sayyidina Muhammad. Allahumma salli wa sallam wa barak ala Sayyidina Muhammad. Allahumma salli wa sallam wa barak ala Sayyidina Muhammad. Allahumma salli wa sallam wa barak ala Sayyidina Muhammad. Allahumma salli wa sallam wa barak ala Sayyidina Muhammad. Allahumma salli wa sallam wa barak ala Sayyidina Muhammad. Allahumma salli wa sallam wa barak ala Sayyidina Muhammad. Allahumma salli wa sallim wa an'im wa aklim wa barik ala habibina wa shafi'ina wa qurrati uyurina sayyidina wa maulana muhammadin sallallahu alayhi wa sallam Bismillah, alhamdulillah, wa salatu wa salamu ala rasulillah wa ala alihi wa sahbihi wa man wala wa la hawla wa la quwata illa billah wa la hawla wa la quwata illa billah Allahumma salli wa sallim wa barik ala sayyidina muhammadin fil awaleen وصلي وسلم وبارك على سيدنا محمد في الآخرين وصلي وسلم وبارك على سيدنا ومولانا محمد صلى الله عليه وسلم في الملأ الآلاء إلى يوم الدين ثم أما بعد الحمد لله ثم الحمد لله الذي الحمد لله الذي بنعمته وبفضله تتم الصالحات we praise Allah and we thank him and it's only by the grace of Allah سبحانه وتعالى and the blessing of Allah سبحانه وتعالى do virtuous matters transpire and bifadlillah by the grace of Allah we gather every Thursday in this time in the evening of Jumu'ah as uh, we await the day of Jumu'ah we come together to prepare our hearts spiritually and to get our minds in the place in a space of loving surrender thoughtfulness of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and a disposition of fikr and also in a in a disposition of dhikr, of remembrance, praising Allah and thanking Allah, sending salawat upon our beloved messenger Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. We come together every week to prepare our hearts. The day of Jumu'ah is a sacred day, a blessed day that's full of blessings, it's full of istijaba, full of acceptance of dua. It's a day of uh, when salawat are presented to the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. And so it behooves us to prepare our hearts and that's why from the practice of the ulama and the awliya of the past is that they would gather the muslimin Thursday nights as a, a source of pre- preparation, um, as an effort to prepare oneself for the day of Jumu'ah. So inshallah, we gather in these ways, in these moments, in these times, sa'ilina wa rajina, asking and hoping that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala yataqabbalna fi salihin, that he would accept us uh, as amongst the righteous and that he would and that he shines our path and, and elucidates a beautiful path of ubudiyah, of living in loving surrender, servitude, and uh, hoping that Allah accepts us as his humble servants. You know, we we have so much going on in our lives that distract us and that consume us, that occupy us. And it's very easy to forget, very easy to become uh, neglectful and thoughtless and wayward. And so we hope that these efforts and these attempts are opportunities for us to uh, come together to receive the blessings of Allah because Allah loves to see the ibad, the servants gathering together. And uh, and, and in those spaces, Allah's mercy descends and, and tranquility envelops. And uh, Allah mentions and praises these gatherings. He loves to see his ibad in this way. So he showers them with grace, designates angels for them. Uh, May Allah make these from the jalasat of mahabba, from the gatherings of love and the gatherings of barakah, the gatherings of goodness and beauty and bounty and tranquility and ease and hidayah, guidance. Allahumma ameen, ya rabbil alameen. So inshallah today we're going to be reflecting on the 69th <coughs> wisdom of Ibn Ata'illah al-Sakandari, rahimahullah wa nafa'ana allahu bi'ulumihi fi darayni, ameen, where he says, qallama uh, this is a little bit of a, of a heavy one, but inshallah, hopefully um, we can clarify it. Once again, I'll read the Arabic. He says, 
قلما تكون الواردات الإلهية إلا بغتة صيانة لها أن يدعيها العباد بوجود الاستعداد So Ibn Atayullah is saying it is rare that the divine that divine inspirations come except suddenly الواردات الإلهية divine inspirations Ibn Atayullah is telling us that it is the case that Allah brings these types of divine inspirations to the ibad, to his servants, all of his servants, in a state of baghta, in a sudden type of uh, experience. He brings it suddenly. That's the nature of divine inspirations. It's a sudden occurrence that happens in the life of a abd min ibadillah, servant from the servants of Allah. Siyanatan laha, and this is so that the divine inspiration is protected from servants claiming them, i.e. claiming the divine inspirations as being by virtue of the existence of their receptivity on their part. Meaning that Allah brings divine inspirations in a uh, in a, a momentary type of thing, in a sudden reality, so that divine inspirations are not attributed by servants as being because of something that is ready or a receptivity or something about them, their actions, their behaviors that then brought about or brings about such realities. It's slightly convoluted, but inshallah with explanation and some examples, you'll understand the significance of this. This is because, as many ulama have indicated, there's a distinction between al-ishraq al-qalbi, al-ishraq al-qalbi meaning the illumination of the heart. The illumination of the heart is something that comes about is a fruit of al-istiqama, a fruit of steadfastness on the path, is a fruit of worship, is a fruit of coming close to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala through the recitation of the Qur'an, through remembrance, etc. So there is an illumination in the heart, ishraqul qalb, that happens because of things that a believer does, a servant does. And they have a, a, a preparedness because of their relationship to Allah, their closeness to Allah, etc. However, divine inspirations, which are these moments where an individual, whoever they may be, they may be close to Allah or far from Allah, they have this, this, this inspiration that comes into their heart. Something that speaks to them in a moment, in a moment's notice where they are awakened from heedlessness, awakened from ghafla, and they're, perhaps their hearts maybe were hard, and then they hear something, they see something, they experience something, and their hearts become soft. Or perhaps they were turned away from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in total, and they hear something or feel something or think something or experience something that makes them turn to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So this is al-warid al-ilahi. Now why is this the case? Let's see what Sidi Ahmad Zarruq says in this regard. He says in the explanation of this hikmah, قَلَّ أَيْ قَلِيلٌ مَا تَأْتِي الْوَارِدَاتِ إِلَّا بَغْتَ It is rare that these waridat, these divine inspirations, it is rare that they come in any other state other than suddenly. فَهِيَ فِي الْأَكْثَرِ in, in, For the most part, these divine inspirations come in an unspecified time. There's no direct causation or correlation between actions and divine inspirations. They come in, in undefined or undetermined times and without any specific preparedness. There's no expectation. You know, one was doing a certain things and then divine inspiration came. There's no, there's no exact correlation in that way. So in terms of whether it's time or actions. 
And so Abdul Qadir al Jailani, the great uh, spiritual master, when describing these waridat al ilahiyya, these divine inspirations, he says the following Al warid al ilahi la yati bistida'a. The divine inspiration does not come because one summons it or calls it and does not go away from a person because of a particular reason, meaning a divine inspiration is not attached to, for example, a person's sin, so therefore divine inspirations go. Or conversely, a person does something good, so divine inspirations come. Divine inspirations are not tied into your acts of worship or your acts of sinfulness. And divine inspirations don't come in one particular style. وَلَا فِي وَقْتٍ واحد, Or one distinct time. And the reason this is the case, Sidi Ahmed Zarouq indicates, he says, number one, the reason why divine inspirations, this moment where someone who may be close or far from Allah has a moment of inspiration and an awakened state where they feel they want to go to Allah or think of Allah or get close to Allah or repent or turn back to Allah, etc., these divine inspirations come in this way because of three reasons. Number one, he says, فيها, So that you know and you can identify Allah's generosity and His kindness and His gift-giving nature in that divine inspiration. Because that divine inspiration is not associated with anything in particular, has nothing to do with something that you were doing or not doing, then therefore you can identify clearly that this was a pure gift from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. لِيُقَدِّرْ قَدْرَهَا وَيَعْظُمَ الْفَرَحُ بِهَا That you give this divine inspiration its own independent value and that you value it independently because it just came from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. No strings attached. And so your joy becomes magnified uh, because of this this you know, un, undeserving or un, uh, un, un, uh, uh, you know, uh, un, unconsidered gift. This is not a gift that you had considered or thought or were planning for or had tried to do things to get it. No, it's just something that Allah gave you. So you find joy in that. And lastly, so that you, you are protective over it and that you honor it. And because something that is that comes from Al-Aziz, the magnificent one, it is in itself Aziz, it is a magnificent thing. So once you identify that this is from Al-Aziz and it's a gift from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, something that you had nothing to do with and it just came from him, and so therefore it has a unique, precious quality because it's from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. I was just in the street and I was on the phone and working and then um, suddenly it, I was reminded to, to say la ilaha illallah or to say alhamdulillah or to get down and pray. Just something came to my heart, pure as a gift from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. You know, or that you're in the depths of a sin and completely forget about Allah, but you find your conscience kicking in, and it causes you and compels you to walk away from, from, from that sin, and turn back and seek forgiveness and feel regret, purely a gift minna min Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, a gift from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And so therefore, one of the ulama says in this regard, لِكَيْ يَتَبَيَّنَ صَاحِبُ هَذَا الْقَلْبِ أَنَّهَا عَطِيَّةٌ مِّنَ اللَّهِ جَاءَتْ so that the, 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 the possessor of this heart, whoever this person is, neither whether near or far, can value and appreciate annaha atiyya, it's a gift, it's a giving from Allah. Ja'athu. Duna tasabbub minhu. Without any causality, without anything you have done to get that gift, that divine inspiration. Duna juhudin awtawakwa. There's no nothing you exerted, nor that you would even have expected this. You know, you're just literally in the middle of some reality and then suddenly an ayah comes to your heart. Someone, you know, tells you something that reminds you of something that gets you close to go back to Allah. It brings you out, etc. 
He blesses you with this divine inspiration in a moment's notice. Do nartibat bimuqaddimat min al-ta'ati aw al-qurubat without any connection to um, precedents such as acts of worship or acts of piety. And this reality is uh, associated with so many of us who sinned or who were far from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, who find themselves in a semi, if you will, not even semi, but fully miraculous, uh, blessed fashion, turning back to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And this turning back to Allah had no precedent to it. There was just, no, there was no indication that this may be a reality for me, that I'm going to go back to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Um, and, and so, and, and we see stories such as this, so many stories. You have the famous story of uh, Al-Fudayl ibn Iyad. And Al-Fudayl ibn Iyad, he was a, a, a great spiritual master and scholar of the second century who was known as the worshiper of the Haramain. He was the identifiable figure who worshipped between Mecca and Medina. And people knew of him and they sang his praises and they would go to him for, for nasiha, for advice and for guidance on all matters and all affairs. This was a someone who people began to look at and they would point at him. Yusharu ilayhi bil banan. They would they would seek him out specifically because of his 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 piety and his standing in this regard. But the well, interesting thing is that that's not how he started off his quote unquote career. Before this, he was actually known as a, a serious miscreant and one of the most dangerous people of the Haramain. To the extent that people developed, he developed a notoriety in the Haramain between Mecca and Medina in a way that he was the most a talented thief. And, and people would explicitly be thoughtful and mindful of their belongings, fearing um, that they would be a victim of Al-Fudayl ibn Iyad. And if you go and research who this man is and you, you see how the ulama reference him for all sorts of matters in the deen, you'll be astonished to learn that he had such a disastrous uh, uh, path in life that he was following, you know, striking fear into people's heart, stealing from them in ways that they could not conceive of. People would 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 sit there and would try their best to, to hide their belongings in some way. Al-Fudayl ibn Iyad would find them, etc. So there, there, they say that there's two distinct moments in his life that brought that were a moment of serious awakening, moments of, of true divine inspiration. One time he was sitting, and he was sitting behind a wall. And um there were two guys on the other side of the wall and they were they had they were they were dealing with their own personal belongings and so they said you know we have to be very careful about our belongings because you know we need to make sure that our belongings do not get uh, taken by al fudayl ibn Iyad. and and he al fudayl is hiding and he hears these people literally talking about how they are here in mecca to worship Allah, to go to the Kaaba, to 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 you know do the Umrah, do their Hajj, etc., and that they are terrified of the threat of Al Fudayl ibn Iyad. So he was not being pious. He was not thinking about any particular thing other than how he's gonna you know who his next victim is or what he's gonna steal next. But overhearing those two people speaking and being so fearful of him, something came into his heart. And that thing was a type of real um, sense of, 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 of self-disgust. He said to himself, how could it be that people have come to these lands to worship Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, to gain his favor and his pleasure, to, to worship and surrender him, Allah, and they are, they are here and they're talking about me and they're fearful of me. So that was something that really shocked him. And it was a moment of divine inspiration that awakened his heart. And, and later on, he kind of continued in his ways, but this was a moment of awakeness. He, he contemplated it, and then he kind of continued. In another circumstance, some time later, 
there was a different vice, which was he had a girlfriend, a woman, a jariya, a woman that he used to go visit and was in a relationship that was fully haram. So he's, he's climbing over a wall that he would climb over to go to her. And he's walking down the steps. And as he's walking down the steps, he's about to go to her. He's about to meet her. He hears someone reciting the verse, Alam yatni lilladina amanu an takhsha'a quluhuhum li dhikrillahi wa ma nazala. He says, I, he hears the verse, is it not time? Is it not time? Alam yatni lilladina amanu. Is it not time for those who say, I believe? And an takhsha'a quluhuhum li dhikrillah, that their hearts are, are fearful and tranquil of the remembrance of Allah and what has been brought to them from truth. So he hears this verse and he immediately freezes in his path. And he says, and he proclaims, Ya Allah, Al-An, now, it is time. It is time for me to fully return. And subhanAllah, this reality then transformed him, these divine inspirations, which Allah gave him as a gift without any precursors or any precedent or any expectation, any thought process, nothing. Allah just gave him a divine inspiration as a gift. He, he embraced this divine inspiration and it transformed him into the abid of the haramain, the worshiper of the haramain, this pious, spiritual master, theologian, scholar, who becomes known throughout centuries until today, we still learn and benefit from his sayings and his guidance and his scholarship. A man who transformed, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala transformed him through what? Divine inspiration. This is why Ibn Ata'illah is saying this, the importance of this hikmah is realizing that al-waridatul ilahiyya, true divine inspirations, these are things that come baghtatan, suddenly. And they are not to be attached to anyone of us who assume that perhaps this has something to do with something I have done. Something pious that I am or, or pi pious actions or righteous deeds or things that I've been doing. No, that righteous deeds and actions and piety and worship, which is, which is all absolutely necessary. This is not to say that somehow pious piety and righteousness and, and ibadah and ta'a, worship and obedience is somehow insignificant or unnecessary. A'udhu billah, we're not even remotely indicating that. He's just saying that the result of that is something called al-ishraqat al-qalbiya, is that the heart it gets becomes illuminated and you fall into, for example, mahabba, love of Allah and loving surrender and you enter into a, uh, uh, you know, al-hadr al-ilahiyya, into the divine presence. That's all through what? Amal, amal, work, actions, ibadah, purifying the heart, you know, at takhliya tahliya, ridding your heart and beautifying your heart. So there's spiritual work that we have to do as believers to be on the path of piety and righteousness, to attain the pleasure and the aid of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. What we're talking about is in the context of when people get, with no strings attached, with no precedence, a divine inspiration. This must be affirmed as a pure gift from Allah that is devoid of any recognition for anything or anyone or any time or any period. This is the whole essence of this hikmah. It is to value and appreciate, as Sidi Ahmed Zarruq said, and, and, and to qaddar bi qadriha, that you value it and appreciate when Allah opens your heart to something. Perhaps, and so many of us can, can attest to moments where we weren't even thinking of being close to Allah. We weren't even thinking of going to the masjid. We weren't even thinking of, you know, uh, of praying or giving a particular sadaqah, a charity. And then something happened and someone came and a message came to me. And then suddenly I find myself, I'm writing a check for a couple hundred dollars or, or, ten, or tens of thousands of dollars. These are divine inspirations. I wasn't even planning to uh, attend this lecture, this lecture or this dars, but subhanAllah, you know, Allah wills that I, I was visiting a friend and he said, let's go, we're going to go to this lecture or I'm sitting at someone's house and they turn on the computer and the lecture is there and I'm listening now to, you know, these uh, hikam of Ibn Ata'illah, etc. And you find yourself in spaces and places that, you did not plan for, you did not prepare for, you did not even desire or seek, but Allah is 
he's inspiring you in a way to bring you close to him, to turn you back to him. This is something that Allah does all the time with his ibad. He does it with everyone who's near and everyone who's far. You, we can listen to endless stories of, of people who've, 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 returned, who've you know, reverted from, from, for example, Christianity or Judaism into Islam. People who, who made the transition from Christianity, Judaism, atheism, Buddhism into Islam. You know, people who, for example, you know, I, I've, I've heard the stories of, you know, people who are just literally in, in prison. And, you know, they bump into someone who says, Assalamu alaikum, like, what's that? And then that turns into their path of return to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Or someone who, who literally, you know, became Muslim because of Islamophobia. They heard, you know, they, they, they heard people attacking Islam and Allah inspired this, you know, child's heart who's 13 years old in the middle of, you know, uh, uh, the Bible belt to say, you know what, I want to, open up uh, the Quran and read and he starts to read and then becomes a pious Muslim and you know fully surrenders to the way of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala these are all through what? divine inspirations mahdu karamihi wa fadlihi wa judihi wa annihi pure generosity pure kindness pure gift from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala so all of us should value and appreciate that these divine inspirations exist you know, the, the, one of the famous examples of, of these kind of moments in our past is uh, a man by the name of Bishr al-Hafi, uh, Bishr the Barefoot. And um, he has also a very profound story. They say that he was the Amir of al-Basra in Iraq. And that he, he, used to have, uh, he used to have this big, you know, kind of palace where it would just be massive parties and massive, you know, drinking and loud music and just parties, lahu, and all sorts of entertainment. So uh, a man is walking by, a simple man, disheveled. He knocks on the door. And um, the jariya, like the, the, the servant, uh, opens and says, you know, yes. So the man asks a question. And he says, uh, is the person who lives here, is he a free man or is he a slave? So the, the, the jariya laughs and just kind of like, Hishes him off and, and slams the door. So she goes to Bishr Hafi as he was sitting. And she says to him, uh, he goes to her, who was that at the door? She says, oh, it was some crazy man. He was, and what did he want? Well, he was asking whether or not you were a free man or a slave. And so Bishr's heart just comes to life and he shrieks and he jumps up and he's barefooted. So he runs into the street and he runs down as far as he, uh, as long as he needed to until he found the man as he was barefooted. And so he grabs the man. He says, you know, who are you? What did you want? So he said, nothing. I just came and I, I, I wanted to know, um, you know, who lived here. Be, and I wanted to know whether this person was a free man or a slave. And the Jadia, she told me that this is a free man. And so... I said, now this man is saying, this disheveled man said, I said to myself, of course, there was, there was never, no way could a true slave ever behave like this. Only a free man would behave like this. And so Bish heard these words and they were like a spear into his soul. Just cut him very deep into his essence. And he fell down on the floor crying. And he turned to Allah and he says, Ya Allah, I testify, Wallahi, I am your slave and all I am is a slave and I will never live by anything except as a slave from this day forward. So here is a moment of profound inspiration. You know, just to, 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 to be present as Allah wills, that he opens up your heart to hear something or to feel something or to see something. And it's it's a spark that is awakened within you to say, you know what, wait, hold on. Let me pause and think. What is what what am I doing? Where am I going? You know, how can I be doing the things that I'm doing? And and this is what happened to Bishl Hafi. And if you go back and you research who Bishl Hafi is. 
and you read the details of who he becomes thereafter as one of the greatest pious predecessors, a man of, of, of tremendous piety and spiritual mastery. Because of what? Because of a moment of divine inspiration that came suddenly. You know, brothers and sisters, you know, in, in my own kind of role as an imam or as a sheikh in the communities, I've been approached by so many different people that I'm always just awed and, and, and inspired. And sometimes my jaw drops to witness the blessing of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala with people. You know, Allah says in Surah Al-Hujurat, I want to say this before I share a story. Allah says in Surah Al-Hujurat, verse number 7, وَعْلَمُوا أَنَّ فِيكُمْ رَسُولَ اللَّهِ لَوْ يُطِيعُكُمْ فِي كَثِيرٍ مِّنَ الْأَمْرِ لَعَنِتُمْ And be aware that it is Allah's Messenger who is among you, Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. In many matters, you would certainly suffer if he were to follow your wishes. وَلَكِنْ Listen to this. لَكِنَّ اللَّهَ حَبَّبَ إِلَيْكُمُ الْإِيمَانَ وَزَيَّنَهُ فِي قُلُوبِكُمْ وَكَرَّهَ إِلَيْكُمُ الْكُفْرَ وَالْفُسُوقَ وَالْعِصْيَانَ It is Allah, God, that has endeared faith to you. He, Allah has made faith, belief, something beloved to you. And He has made it beautiful in your hearts. It is Allah who does that. Allah who brings inspiration into our hearts to make something to make faith an endearing thing, a beautiful thing, something lovely. And he has made it <clears throat> that we, we, we love it and we identify it as a beautiful thing. And he has made disbelief and he has made mischief and he has made disobedience hateful to you. It is people like this who are rightly guided. But then the next ayah, verse number eight, Allah says, Fadlam min Allahi wa ni'ma. Wallahu alimun hakim. Through God's favor and blessing, all of this that He brings Iman into our hearts makes Islam beautiful in our hearts. This is Fadlam min Allah. That Allah makes kufr and fusuq, disbelief and mischief and disobedience, hateful to our hearts. Hadha fadlum min Allah. This is a grace and a blessing from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Fadlam min Allahi wa ni'ma. Wallahu alimun hakim. God is all knowing and all wise. So, this, what is so integral in this space is that we recognize and affirm always that moments of piety and remembrance and awakeness, these are, this is from the grace of Allah that he gifts us as his servants. We shouldn't associate it with anything or anyone, any action, any reality, any person. You should only affirm it to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. I've, you know, as I was saying, I've been in circumstances where when I hear certain stories, I'm, I'm truly amazed. You know, I, I've had people who come to me and they'll say to me, Sheikh, listen, for the, these are people who grew up as Muslims. And who, you know, ha, ha studied the Quran and went to Sunday school and did the, you know, the status quo kind of Muslim life thing. And then suddenly they just find themselves in a path of misdirection. People will tell me, you know, what, I've been for the past three years. I haven't prayed one Juma. I haven't prayed one prayer. Um, I, I used to have so much Quran memorized. I forgot almost all of it, except a few small chapters. Um, furthermore, I've entered into vices that are truly ugly and, and disgusting. You know, I, I, you know, some people will tell me, you know, I, I've been sleeping around um, and soliciting all sorts of uh, things on, 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 you know, through different mediums, applications and things like that. And just completely hedonist and completely heedless you know, just fully indulgent in every desire, food, drink, even eating things that are completely haram, indulging in sensual acts that are completely haram, absolutely categorically haram, um, you know, etc. I don't want to be explicit. 
And people will come and they'll say these things to me. And, and then they'll say the following. And wallahi, this happens more often than many of you may truly imagine. But it does. It happens a lot. They'll say to me, I don't know why. That's how it starts. I don't know why. But I felt that I needed to reach out to you. You know, I don't know why, but I felt like I needed to call you. And so subhanAllah, they do. You know, they reach out, uh, they call, uh, they, you know, can contact me in some direct or indirect way. And they say, I need to speak to you. And I'll say, what's up? What's going on? You know, I, I, sometimes I won't know these people. Sometimes I'll know them. And they'll say, you know what? I just, I don't know why, but something came over my heart and I felt a need to reach out. I felt the need to come to the masjid. I felt the need to ask, speak to a sheikh you know, whatever, any sheikh. What's the story? Well, here's my life over the past few years and a really just completely off the path of piety and righteousness and obedience. And I've been living like a heathen. I've been living like an absolute, you know, ingrate. People have described themselves this way to me. But I felt, uh, you know, something happened to me where I just felt like I need to contact you or con go to the masjid. And so I'll sit down and talk with them. And, and so often people are like, you know, just, so what do you think of me? Well, how would you describe me? What would you identify me as? And, you know, as I'm sitting there, and I, and I mean this in Wallahi, so genuinely, sincerely, I tell these people, I do not view you or observe you as anything other than someone that Allah cares about. Someone that Allah wants khair for, that Allah wants goodness for you. Allah wants happiness for you. Allah wants ease for you. Allah wants guidance for you. And they'll say, how could you say that? I'll say, what? why else? Why else do you think that as you were doing everything you were doing, and there's just no quote-unquote Islam in sight? No, someone was telling me, I literally spent two years plus, I did not see or interact with one Muslim. Didn't see a hear a, a reminder, a khutbah, anything. Just completely indulgent in whatever vice and heedless lifestyle I was in. So if if you were in that reality, but then suddenly Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala wills and inspires your heart to go to the masjid and to go at a random moment and to bump into the, you know, people say, people will literally sometimes look at me like, I can't believe I'm standing in front of you right now. I'll say, why? And they'll say, you can't, you don't understand, Sheikh. I was just, you know, thinking and I, and I was like, you know, let me go and perhaps I'll see. And then here you are. And I, 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 I don't even know how this exactly happened. And I'll say, so, Mashiatullah, it's the will of Allah. It's his warid al waridat al ilahiyah, divine inspirations. He inspires the heart to come and then he allows realities to ensue. So when I, when I meet people like this, and we are all people like this, none of us are you know, special beings. We're all simple servants on the path of trying to attain divine pleasure, right? We're trying to live lives that are meaningful. And very often we fall and we trip and we, we slip up and we veer off and we forget. You know, sometimes we'll go a period of time too many, too long away from the masjid. Uh, away from Muslimin, away from lectures and 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 durus and reminders and khawatir, uh, away from ibadah, away from salah, away from you know uh, sadaqa and dhikr and dua. And then you know Allah from His grace He opens up the heart and He says, "Remember, don't forget about me. I care about you, and I want you to care about me." That's from His His love. And 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 the remarkable thing is we're not deserving. It's not as if we are deserving of this. You know, none of us would identify for ourselves. That's why when I tell people, you know, this is an indication that Allah cares about you, they will be almost borderline bothered. Like, Sheikh, don't play around with me. You know, don't just say things to me. Don't, don't, don't just say things because it's like the nice thing to say because you, know, you want to make me feel better. And I'll say, it's not about making you feel better. I'm not, you know, Allah, I'm not trying to, to make you feel good. I'm not just, I'm not going to play around with the deen. So that, you know, I, I give you a little emotional boost. Oh, why else would you come to the masjid? Why else would you think to, to, to speak to a sheikh? Why else would you turn on a dars? 
you know, people tell me, well, I, I'm, I'm like literally, you know, in the middle of a disastrous situation. I don't know where to go, where to turn. And I literally just open up my phone. And the first thing I see is, you know, just something that pops up. And it's like a, 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 a an ayah that reminds me specifically of the thing that I need to be reminded of, you know, of not fearing Allah. Uh, 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 because I haven't been fearing Allah sufficiently. I've been so fearful of losing my job. And then, you know, I'll just open up my phone and the verse that I see right in front of my face and somehow it popped up. Someone shared it. My mother shared it with me. And I usually don't really look at all the messages that my mother or my aunts or whoever share with me. But then this one verse is like, wa you know, rizq, your risk, your sustenance is, is in the skies, everything and everything that is promised to you. Something that really affirms, like, why have I can't believe I've been like literally losing sleep and 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 riddled with anxiety for these past days, thinking about money, and, and here this ayah comes, and it's not as if you did anything other than just picked up your phone and you saw an ayah, and so all of those divine inspirations, they are gifts from Allah Subhanahu wa Taala. They are gifts that indicate that Allah cares about you. And that Allah wants us to go back to Him. Allah wants us to turn back to Him. Allah wants us to remember Him. You know, Alam Yatni Liladina Amanu and Takshaa Kulubuhum Lidikri Lahi. That's the reality. Is it not time that the, the believers' hearts turn back to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala? One of the, the pious uh, predecessors as well, one of his stories of return is that he was walking also completely heedless, disconnected from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. He's walking in the marketplace and he sees a piece of paper with Allah's name in it on the ground that people were thoughtlessly stepping on. It wasn't an act of you know aggression. People were just kind of walking and here is this little piece of parchment, a kaghid as the narration says, a piece of parchment that's on the floor and has Allah's name on it and people are stepping on it. So someone who didn't really care about Allah, didn't care about the Prophet, didn't care about piety, didn't care about righteousness. He wasn't a quote-unquote you know, sheikh or whatever. And so he he runs and he picks it up and he wipes it off and he kisses it and he puts it in his pocket. And then he hears, and then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala gives him an inspiration to do that. But also then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in his dreams tells the man, just as you have, you know, honored me by picking my name up off the ground, then I will honor you by, by raising you high and picking you up. And so that became the path of his piety. You know, just a moment of inspiration. That's why, brothers and sisters, you know, what's so critical is that we don't let these moments of inspiration just pass by us. If you feel in your heart, in any given moment, at night when you're in bed, when you're in your car, uh, you're at school, uh, and a moment of inspiration comes over your heart to give sadaqah, to pray your salah, you know, to pray sunnah. Uh, you remember the significance of reading the Quran, making dhikr. Hold on to that inspiration. It's a, it's a, it's a you know, I've likened in the past these moments of inspiration, like, you know, if you've ever seen, you know, someone in the, in the, in, in the woods who's, uh, let's say, alone and, and doesn't have any resources, and there's a spark that sparks in, 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 in them trying to, for example, build the fire, right? That spark, it becomes such a precious thing. It's still not anything significant, but it has the potential of becoming profoundly significant. But it's that one spark, if the person tends to it very carefully and covers it and protects it and then puts the timber on it and like starts to, the embers, sorry, puts the embers on it slowly but surely and then, you know, you know, let's let's that spark turn into a small little flame, and then from a flame you turn nurture and turns into a fire. Then this small spark becomes into this, you know, full fledged fire that brings you warmth. That it helps you boil your water, helps you cook your food. It, it gives you a, a sense of real safety and security. Animals will see that there's a fire here, so that they'll stay away from it. Um, it, it it's a sign. It's a signal for people to to know that you're there, etc. Right, so many benefits to having a fire anywhere in the world, right? And so, you know, that's the nature of a divine inspiration. When you receive it, in any circumstance that you're in, hold on to it, nurture it, you know. 
um, and, and, and protect it and, and slowly grow it and blow on it slowly but surely. Don't just neglect. If you have a spark, a divine inspiration, if you let it go, guess what happens? It just goes. Also, if you blow too hard onto it and you get too aggressive, what happens? You may blow it out, <laughs> you know? So you have to nurture these divine inspirations. You protect them, you hold on to them, you become thankful to Allah, and then you nourish it and you grow it slowly and you turn it into something far more substantial. And, and that's, you know, the, the spirit, the essence um, of this reality. And, and it is the case that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, as we mentioned, He gives this to everyone. And he gives it to people who are close and people who are far. But Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says in uh, in Surah al uh, Surah Al-A'raf verse number 146 something that I think all of us should be very mindful of. Where he says Jalla fi ula sa'asrifu an ayati alladhina yatakabbaruna fil ardi bi ghayri al-haqq wa in yaraw kullu ayatin la yu'minu biha وَإِنْ يَرَوْ سَبِيلَ الرُّشْدِ لَا يَتَّخِذُهُ سَبِيلًا وَإِنْ يَرَوْ سَبِيلَ الْغَيِّ يَتَّخِذُهُ سَبِيلًا ذَلِكَ بِأَنَّهُمْ كَذَّبُوا بِآيَاتِنَا وَكَانُوا عَنْهَا غَافِلِينَ Allah says, I will keep distracted from my signs. سَأَصْرِفُ عَنْ آيَاتِي I'll keep distracted from my signs. I'll keep people away from my signs. Who? Those who behave arrogantly on earth without any right. And who, even if they see... Every sign will not believe in them. They will not take the way of right guidance if they see it, but will take the way of error if they see it. This is because they denied our signs and paid them no heed. Brothers and sisters, we want to be people that even if it is the case that we are distant or that we are far or that we are sinful or that we are weak, that we never become arrogant and and that we never reject, that we never turn our backs on Allah with a dismissive arrogance and a rejection of the divine. It's very different to walk on this earth as a weak, sinful person who may be very far from Allah, but not because of arrogance or rejection, just because of weakness. That is a far, quote-unquote, safer disposition to be in than to be someone that Allah will turn against and not just not give divine inspiration, but perhaps turn against. You know, رُبَّ مَعْصِيَةٍ أَوْرَثَتْ ذُلًّا وَانْكِسَارًا There are perhaps sins that they, uh, they nourish within you a disposition of humility and brokenness. And that's far greater than an act of piety to, 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 that, that may instill within you is وَاسْتِكْبَار You know, a sense of uh, haughtiness and, and magnificence and arrogance. You know, so so we, as we journey in life, and you know, we're all struggling to be on that path, and inshallah, we're closing now. If you have any questions, you can put them, inshallah. But, you know, we're all trying to be on this path together. We're trying to figure out a way to Allah that's meaningful, where we're trying to negotiate life in a way that doesn't, you know, end up us being in a very compromised state. But inshallah, the pathway to doing that is working our best to maintain our piety, to pray our five prayers, to fast our fast, to give our charity, to stay away from the haram, but also to embrace the divine inspirations, al-waridat al-ilahiyya. We want al-ishraqat al-qalbiyya, we want the illuminated hearts and the, 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 the illuminescence of the hearts that come from worship and istiqamah and steadfastness and you know uh, piety, etc. We also want to embrace the divine inspirations that come to us from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, that are, you know, unrestricted, no strings attached, no, not connected to anything but His grace and His generosity and His kindness. And we take that and we transform it, bi'idhnillah, into a life of, of worship, a white life of surrender, a life of beauty, bi'idhnihi wa bifadlihi, by His permission, by His grace. I pray that Allah makes us amongst those who are always inspired to turn back to Him. May Allah never deprive us of inspiration and guidance and beauty and bounty that awakens our hearts and souls to always be back and to return no matter how far we get, that we always have a pathway to get back. And that's the beauty of this deen. When you hear all these stories of tawbah, all these stories of repentance, all these stories of those who went very far and then came back, you'll see that Allah 
always facilitates pathways for people to come back to him. Always by by his fog, you know, and 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 just and embrace that reality. Know that the door is never closed. No one listening to me or anyone that you know should ever write off for themselves the possibility of return to Allah, no matter how far, no matter how evil, no matter how destitute you may think your state is. No one should ever write themselves off from the rahmah of Allah. Allah does not like that. Allah hates those who lose hope in Him. And Allah loves to forgive. And Allah loves to uh, f forgive and to cleanse and to beautify his ibad. Um, how someone can know if he is arrogant or just weak? Barakallahu feekum, akhi nidal. I think the distinction is that arrogance is, it's a disposition of, you know, I don't need this. You know, um, I don't need, a'udhu billah, even to say such words. I don't need Allah. I don't need these remembrances. This religion is X. Allah is Y. You know, this whole thing is an X. And you, you, a person develops a very angry, haughty, um, a dismissive disposition towards it, almost as like a, an ideologue, a dogmatic ideologue. There's people, when you listen to them talk about Islam, it's rageful. It's full of hate and disdain and disgust and mockery, right? And it's not even to say that those people don't have that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala qad yatubu alayhim. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, naam, qad yatubu ala ayyu wahid min basharillah. But as people who are who are worshippers of Allah, who want to ensure that divine inspirations never stop coming, then never find yourself arrogantly rejecting Allah. If, you, if I am not doing what Allah is asking me to do out of weakness, it's a very different disposition. That means I'm not... It's just lazy or it's, you know, I'm just overwhelmed or I'm tired or I feel weak or I, I you know, I, I wish I could, but I don't know how to. I, I feel intimidated. I, I, I've written myself off because I just feel like I'm uh, like, what, what's the point of even trying? You know, I've tried so much in my life, but it just doesn't work. That's a weak disposition. An arrogant disposition is, is, is you know dogmatic it's aggressive it's like an ideologue someone who 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 rejects the signs of allah who dismisses allah dismisses the mercy of allah with a type of uh, um ta'ali ala allah and that's hasha what is very ugly and which truly limits it uh, as allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says sa'asrifu an ayati sa'asrifu an ayati alladhina yatakabbaruna fil ard bi ghayr al haq you know that's who allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will turn away from his signs wallahu alam Inshallah, we'll wait for Wayakum Sidi. Barakallahu Fikum Akhi Habib. If there's any other comments or questions or anything, Inshallah, we'll wait a moment or so. If not, then we'll um, uh, close bi ithnillahi ta'ala. Um, can an arrogant person become an overwhelmed person? Can you elaborate on that, Sister Angela? What do you mean by that? An arrogant person become an overwhelmed person. Uh, maybe if you could just elaborate. I'm not sure I understand the question. Can an arrogant person become an overwhelmed person? I'm just waiting for the clarification, inshallah. If anyone else has questions or comments, please put them in the comment section. I mean, if I, if perhaps if you were referring to when I said overwhelmed, just by the fact of a, um, does and there's one if someone is arrogant at first, but then understands what he is uh, missing and realizes he is weak. Yeah, that's a that's a very different uh, disposition. I mean, so a person may begin arrogant and then realize, for example, that you know they're missing something profound and. Um, then, then yes, it is a transition that is a form of Allah's rahmah, Allah's mercy, transitioning someone from a from an arrogant person to a weak person who's missing out. That's a type of uh, divine inspiration. You know, don't reject what you don't know. Um, you know, <clears throat> don't reject what you don't understand. Uh, don't just reject arrogantly and blindly. You know, that's a that's ugly. But maybe now I realize, oh my God, I've been I've been you know. 
all these years because this happens by the way there's people and i i i've met many people like this who they 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 were very cavalier and very confident about what they believed in and what they disbelieved in and how you know opinionated they were but then they reach a point in their life where they realize they've been going down such an unfortunate path correct and but then you know they, they don't know how to like they still want to save face well i've been talking all these years about how you know nonsensical this is and this is just for like you know people who are simple minded this religious business like going to the masjid and dressing in a particular way and i don't know why that was all for like whatever x type of people but now i realize hold on that's i should have been doing that all along that's a mercy from allah it's a divine inspiration that that person's heart now is awakened to go back and to be better right and so it is certainly plausible that that transition can happen by the grace of allah subhanahu wa ta'ala does one necessarily need to realize that they received an inspiration to act upon it or it just happens? Um, I don't know that a person necessarily has to realize it with the fullness of their mind because very often people will, like very often when you listen to stories of conversion, you know, back to into Islam, people will say, you know, they'll just use the line, I don't know what happened, right? And then something came over my heart to do X or Y or Z and I just came in. Um, and maybe later on, they realize that this was a divine inspiration. Same thing, like I said, with people who have come back to the path of piety, who are so far away, but then find themselves now praying in the masjid every day. And they say, well, I was not even close, but I was walking in the street. And then I bumped into someone and he said, why don't you, you know, I'm going to the masjid. So I was like, you know what, why not? Why not? I go to the masjid. And then suddenly I've been coming to the masjid and I didn't realize that that was a moment of divine inspiration. I just, you know, I just kind of went with it. So it's plausible that that happens. Wallahu alam. Um, Salaamu alaikum. The stories that you shared about the past pious servants who experienced inspirations that transformed them spiritually were very inspiring. Mashallah. Is there any book that has a collection of these accounts that is translated in English? Um, I don't know of books. I, I I would have to research for you. I'm not sure of books books names, but um, you'll find these in like the collections autobiographical works. Collections of, for example, Hilyatul Awliya, the adornment of the uh, the Awliya, the friends of Allah Subhanahu Wa Taala by Abu Nuaym Al Asfahani. You'll find many of the, these Awliya stories, and they'll start off as, you know, uh, sinners, serious sinners, people who are far away from Allah Subhanahu Wa Taala. Uh, Malik ibn Dinar, famous story. I mean, I gave a khutbah about it. You can probably search for it on Google, uh, on YouTube. I don't know if Ismail, if you're listening, or any of the brothers and sisters on the back end, maybe you can find it and post it in the comment section, but Malik ibn Inad, what a famous story of repentance. Someone who was an a outright drunkard and just an angry drunkard. And his daughter dies and he, you know, decides, you know what, tonight I'm going to get so drunk just as an enraged disposition because Allah, God took my daughter. So almost like I'm going to drink against God. And then he has this dream, and it's a very profound story, and you should really listen to it. It's very inspirational. That completely shifts his entire path in life. And he becomes one of the great spiritual masters of our past. Um, and this was a raging, angry, violent drunkard. SubhanAllah. Um, and Abdullah ibn al-Mubarak, who ends up becoming a student of al-Fudayl ibn Ayyad. <laughs> he himself has a path of tawbah. He was sitting once in a garden, and he's sitting in this garden and, you know, they just, they're, they're, the party's bumping, as they say, you know, the parts, things are happening. The, 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 the you know, alcohol is flowing, the music is blasting, right? And whatever the equivalent was in that time. And, um, and he just, he hears a verse and it awakens his heart and he comes back. So people, are, you can look up the stories of Abdullah ibn al-Mubarak, Fudayl ibn Ayyad, Malik ibn Dinar, Bishl al-Hafi. And the other names that I've mentioned, and and so Abu Nuaym al Asfahani, his book has some of these stories in it, um, and uh, you know, in English, Allahu Alam, I don't know. Khair yeah. inshallah, barakallahu fikum, wa jazakumullah khair. May Allah subhanahu wa taala accept from us all, and may this gathering be a gathering that is pleasing to Allah and accepting to Him, and may Allah bless us all with uh, endless divine inspiration that brings us back and closer and closer to Him. And may Allah grant us illuminated hearts that are always 
in a desire for his pleasure and his guidance and his acceptance of us as his humble servants. As I said, this is the, the evening of Jumu'ah. Tomorrow is a day of Jumu'ah. You know, it's a day of, of ibadah, a day of recitation of, of, of Surah Al-Kahf, a day of worship, a day of dhikr, a day of remembrance, a day of sending salawat upon Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, a day of dua. There's a time of dua that is specific and special to the day of Jumu'ah. So inshallah, I pray that all of us... Um, you know, do not t take advantage. And 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 the ulama, they, they teach us to prepare ourselves Thursday night for, you know, which is Laylatul Jumu'ah, which is Thursday night, the, the evening of Jumu'ah, to prepare ourselves tonight through istighfar, through seeking forgiveness, through salawat, through sending salawat upon the Prophet as a preparation for tomorrow, inshallah. So may Allah help us to be prepared for the bounties of tomorrow. Barakallahu feekum. Wa yakum. وفيكم وجزاكم الله خير وصلى الله على سيدنا محمد وآخر دعوانا أن الحمد لله رب العالمين